there is a Shaivite temple in Hawaii and the chief Swami, Swami Bodhinath, is here in Sydney. We asked him for the purpose of his visit. My name is Sakuru Bodhinath Valen Swami of Kauai Adinam in Hawaii, USA. Well, though the ashram is in Hawaii, the tradition comes from northern Sri Lanka. And this is how that happened. Uh, our guru, Savaya Subramunya Swami, when he was 22 years old, this was back in 1949, uh, traveled to northern Sri Lanka, and there he was introduced to Yoga Swami, a very great mystic, very great yogi of that time. And he had a number of discussions and spent time with Yoga Swami, and as a result was initiated into Saivism and into sannyas back in 1949, and given the instructions to go back to America and teach. So that's what Gurudeva did, and in 1970 he chose to found an international headquarters, which is our monastery in Hawaii, as the center from which to spread uh, Yoga Swami's teachings and his teachings throughout the world. So though our monastery is in Hawaii, our tradition definitely comes from northern Sri Lanka and Saivism of that realm. Well, I think growing up in the West uh, and the way our guru uh, utilized Western technology such as computers and the internet in our work uh, helped us develop a very sophisticated publication system, both printed publication as well as our websites, which have our publications on them as well. So I think in that sense, we may have gotten a head start, an advantage, though of course India is catching up rapidly in the technological area. But uh, Hinduism there as a whole, uh, the different mutts and uh, adinams are not that technologically advanced, though the rest of India uh, has a strong technology sector. So I think in that regard, definitely being in the West uh, gave us a head start in terms of producing our magazine, Hinduism Today, which is all produced digitally in Hawaii and then printed and sent around the world, our books, as well as our uh, internet publications. And when you travel around the world, uh, when you travel in the Western countries where people are not used to seeing a sadhu with the kind of marks on the forward and the clothes, mm -hmm. what kind of reaction do you normally get from people? Well, there's a few reactions. Uh, a common reaction is uh, some they think we're Hare Krishna. Anyone who, who uh, has uh, light skin and is wearing orange robes must be Hare Krishna. <laughs> so uh, we have to explain, no, we're not Hare Krishna. Uh, that's another group. They're the Vaishnava group. We're a Saiva group. Uh, in many uh, more sophisticated parts of United States, uh, you don't really stand out, but in the, the uh, more uh, Christian fundamentalist areas, you, you definitely would, uh, uh, they would think of you as something unusual. And we're quite privileged to be here in Sydney, Australia. The main purpose of our journey is to conduct an inner search travel study program. The name of it is 2006 Australia New Zealand Inner Search. The idea of inner search is illustrated in a paragraph I'm writing for the New Zealand Herald. They asked that I explain Hindu beliefs in a simple way for their general readership. So please let me read that to you. They're asking, what are Hinduism's main principles? So the general answer I give is, Hinduism believes that the purpose of life on earth is to come ever closer to God. It is important to mention that God is not above, but within each of us, there to be experienced. God resides within our soul, 
and the goal is to go deeply enough within to experience oneness with God. To achieve this takes many lives, not just one. It is accomplished through certain spiritual practices. We compare making progress on the Hindu spiritual path to the art of dancing. Everyone knows that the key to becoming a good dancer is practice, daily practice in fact. Hinduism is the same. There are daily practices that need to be done. We divide these practices into four categories, good conduct, service, devotion, and meditation. These practices bring us ever closer to God and give us a deepening experience of the divine until the experience is so profound that there is no need to be reborn on earth again. We have graduated, so to speak, from the university of earthly experience. So that is the idea of inner search, going within. When we go within, we encounter our soul, our divine identity. And when we go even deeper into the essence of the soul, we encounter God. Well, the current, er, the current inner search program uh, focuses on the theme of spiritualizing daily life. And as we mentioned in our general statement, the key to making progress in Hinduism is practice. And one of the biggest obstacles we encounter is a conceptual obstacle, and it goes something like this. Uh, it's a common statement I hear from families I talk to. They say, Swami, we have no time for our spiritual progress. We're so busy with our professional life, raising our children, and the demands of modern existence that we have very little time for our spiritual life. What can we do? It's a very common concern. And so the answer I give starts off by saying we need to change our perspective. That the concept of a separation between spiritual life and secular life is not a Hindu concept. It's a Western concept. For example, in Western religions, in the seven days of the week, one of the days is called the Sabbath day or the holy day. On that day we worship. We can't work. On the other six days of the week, we work, but we don't worship. There's this total separation between worship and work, between a day that is for worship and a day that is for work. This is not the traditional Hindu view. In Hinduism, all seven days of the week are the same. They all provide us opportunities to make spiritual progress. How do we make that progress? Well, that is the theme of the inner search. It gives us 12 simple practices that we can do throughout the day, no matter if we're at the office, at school, or elsewhere. These are basic practices. We call them facing life's challenges and finding opportunities to serve or help others. So we give six examples of each and are discussing them in depth. And the idea is to help everyone utilize every day of their life to make spiritual progress. Well, inner search activities uh, focus on a daily schedule that begins with hatha yoga in the morning and meditation on most days. And then we continue with a few hours of classes in the morning, again in the afternoon, interspersed with formal and informal discussion periods. That's our basic program of study. And then this extends over a number of locations. So we're st we start here, for example, in Sydney, and then we go elsewhere in Australia and New Zealand, and break up the study routine by enjoying the beautiful sights and sceneries of the country that we're in. The general idea of inner search relates to the same idea as pilgrimage in that when we set aside a few weeks, a month or more of our time, when we put aside our normal work routines, our school routines, our domestic duties of taking care of the home, when all of these are set aside, such as they are in a traditional pilgrimage or an inner search program, we're able to be more one-pointed in our spiritual study and therefore make more spiritual progress. So inner search follows this same psychology.
tell a story that happened in Perth. Uh, we were there in Perth uh, for the Kumbhavi Shekham of the Perth Temple in September. And during one of the breaks, we had a chance to talk to some of the youth who were children of the trustees and senior members of the temple. And to them, they asked a very interesting question. They said, you know, this temple that our parents are building is huge. It's costing quite a bit to build and the ma monthly maintenance fee to maintain it is going to be quite large as well. Wouldn't all this money be better spent on something else? You know, that was their question. In other words, what is the value of having such large temples? They went on to say, God exists everywhere, so why do we need temples anyway? So it was a very good question. So I thought about it and I, I gave back the answer, something like this, that though God exists everywhere, how many of us can perceive God? Well, God permeates this room. Can we see God permeating this room? God permeates us. Can we see God permeating us? And of course the answer is most people can't. It's a theory. You have to be a very profound meditator, very advanced meditator to be able to perceive God permeating objects, permeating the room, permeating you. And most people haven't achieved that type of skill in meditation. So just as to observe distant stars, you go to an, uh, an observatory and use a powerful telescope. Similarly, to observe the inside of an atom, you go to a laboratory and use a microscope, electron microscope. To see God, you need to use a tool. And that tool is the Hindu temple. It's within the temple that God's presence is most easily felt. And this is because of the way in which the temple is constructed, consecrated, and the continuous daily worship that happens thereafter. It makes it a very sacred, a very special place where God's blessings flood through the murti or image in the temple and can be felt by sincere devotees during the ceremonies there. So this is the value of the temple. The Hindu point of view, as we mentioned earlier, is that the purpose of life is to experience God. So this is made possible by having temples in our communities. This is the place we can go and be trained to experience God. So that is the value of building temples. And of course, even more so than that, we need to explain to our children and our children's children how the blessings they receive in the temple can benefit their life. It is not self-evident. It needs explanation. It needs good answers. When the correct answers are given, youth and children can see that by worshiping regularly at the temple, and we encourage everyone to do so at least once a week, our life will be happier and more successful as well as more religiously fulfilled. Well, there's, there's not a uniformity uh, in terms of how you can generalize about uh, Hindus in the West and Hindus in the East. Uh, the, one of the common trends is that Hindu parents are focusing on the, the profession of their child and the material status their child can attain without much thought about religion. And this is common in both East and West and is a bit short-sighted uh, because such a person can grow up and achieve the professional success their parents envision and achieve the material success and be quite miserable because that kind of success doesn't bring happiness necessarily. You know, happiness doesn't come from what we have, it doesn't come from possessions. So we know many people who have achieved that and to their surprise they aren't happy because their parents told them they would be. So religion is important, 
uh, all along the way as a child, as a youth, as a young adult, and as an older adult to supplement our professional life and our material ambitions. Professional life and material ambitions are good, but they're not all of life. And we shouldn't think that they'll make us happy. You know, there's a simple phrase we use, happiness doesn't come from getting, it comes from giving. Meaning the Hindu idea of service, of seva, of volunteering, of helping others is a very important part of life that we encourage parents to uh, teach their children from a young age. In fact, as we mentioned earlier in our description of our inner search program, it's right, it's one of the teachings, you know. Learning, think about helping others on a daily basis, even if you're six years old. Your parents can show you how you can do that, how you can give. And by giving to others, feel a happiness. Also, worshiping in the temple can make us happier. Learning how to meditate can make us happier. So these are valuable practices that need to supplement the strong focus on profession and material gain. So this is one theme we, we find in East and West. Another problem is the lack of understanding of the Hindu temple. Uh, Hindu temples are coming up strongly in countries such as Australia, New Zealand, as well as in the US and Canada. And they're built by the first generation of immigrants. And the first generation of immigrants is worshiping in them and then with great joy and doing exactly what they did growing up in their native country. And the second generation comes somewhat reluctantly, at least up until their teens. But quite often the third generation won't even go to the temple. And why is that? Well, no one has explained it to them in a clear way. They don't understand the benefits. And so, you know, I wrote an editorial in our magazine, Hinduism Today, on this called, Will There Be a Third Generation? Meaning, unless something is done by the parents, by the temples, by the swamis, to help the third generation understand the value of temples and temple worship, they may not go. And then we could have empty institutions you know, 30 years from now or so. So this is a very important problem to address. And one simple solution, which we're giving uh, at the Saiba World Conference here, uh, toward the end of the month, we're giving a keynote address, uh, is that children who worship daily in the home shrine are happy to worship once a week at the temple. And this answer puts the burden where it falls, on the parents. That no matter how much the temples try and train children in Hinduism, they can only supplement what the parents do. And the parents need to incorporate religious practices into the daily routine of the family, into the daily routine of the children. And if they're successful in doing that, such as having the whole family attend a morning puja, even if it's only for 10 minutes every day, it makes a tremendous difference on the likelihood of the children when they reach adulthood doing puja in their own home and attending the temple once a week. So our simple statement is, children who attend daily puja once a day in the home are happy to go to the temple once a week. So this is a common problem east and west uh, otherwise, uh, another challenge that's being faced is there's a shortage of Hindu teachers. That temples want to have classes, but they don't find enough individuals who are well qualified to teach. So programs which provide more teachers would be very helpful. We had a we attended a summit conducted by Swami Dayananda Saraswati in New Jersey last year and one of the ideas put forward by a speaker for North America and the same condition may exist here in Australia is that within a few years, within 10 years, a great number of Hindu professionals of the first generation of immigrants will be retiring. And what a wonderful volunteer force to advance Hinduism they could be if temples took advantage of them and 
made sure they were well trained to be teachers and then set up programs where these retired professionals could spend a lot of time teaching Hindu youth and Hindu children the basics of the religion. So it's, it's an excellent idea and uh, meets a great need uh, for those who are outside of India. I'd say it's a common problem outside of India. In India you have more teachers available. Uh, more swamis are there, more pundits are there, uh, communities which just have wise elders within them still exist uh, in, in many parts of India. Whereas outside of India we don't have that. We have a definite shortage of qualified teachers. So this is a wonderful force of retirees that are becoming available soon in many Western countries that could, if the temples had programs, train them as teachers and utilize them as teachers and really advance their religion in a significant way. Well, Shaivism, particularly in its southern form, shall we say, which is the most common form of Shaivism today, uh, is unique in that it emphasizes both temple worship and meditation. It feels that both practices need to be mastered. First, we master temple worship, and once we have a deep love of the deity, a very strong love of the deity through successful temple worship, then we should practice meditation and deepen our experience of God within. So most traditions focus on either temple worship or meditation. Saivism focuses on both and feels that the spiritual path requires us to master both of these uh, practices. research lab uh, at Harvard Medical School. So um, my quest is mainly spiritual at the moment. Um, I don't feel that my life is complete as it is. Um, I don't um, think that I can function well in my job and I can serve my um, colleagues and um, at work and also within the whole field I'm working in without having this background is strong um, um, belief I can I can rely on. My name is Rudy Tansy. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts and I'm a, a scientist, a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School working on the problem of Alzheimer's disease. And I came here with my wife, Dora, uh, with the hopes of learning more about Hinduism. Well, I think one of the goals of Hinduism, as, I, as I've learned it, and I'm still very new to this, uh, is to find uh, joy in life, to have joyous life. And in considering that question, you know, one way to have joy is just to, uh, I guess, uh, relax and do nothing and watch TV, but is that really joy? And I think the joy that can be offered through learning the teachings of uh, Hinduism and Gurudeva at this course is the joy that it involves lots of energy. Uh, lots of vibration inside, being excited about life. So there are different levels of being happy. And so the idea is, can you be happy uh, at a higher level? And I think one of the things that appeals to me and to my wife is that the common theme in Guru Deva's teachings, as I understand it so far, is you must have love. That without love, uh, you don't reach the higher uh, levels of true joy and happiness. And I'm hoping to learn more about that through uh, this course. Hi, my name is Hansa Patel. I am from San Francisco, California, United States. I am here on the inner search hoping to learn how to tap into my inner source of energy and live a joyful life as much as possible. Um, and I hope to accomplish that soon. I think the most um, influential moment for me was when Gurudeva passed away. I feel like his energy still exists with me today. Um, I feel his energy just seeing his picture on a film or on a photograph 
and I feel like he's still here with me. It makes me stronger. It makes me stronger. It makes me feel like he's there carrying me through whatever it is in life that I'm going through. I don't feel alone. I feel like he's always with me to guide me through whatever journey God has for me. Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you to Bodhinata and Gurudev and the monastery. I very much appreciate this experience and um, Om Namah Shivaya.